the MIT entity in Israel. And uh, she has created a center. You know, when people ask me, is there anything like CHM anywhere else in the world? I say, not really, but there's one place that comes close and it's <laughs> Nava's center. Um, and uh, Nava, one of the things I love about her, which you'll, I'm sure, hear about today, is that in addition to the laboratory work that she's done, she is deeply committed to bringing insights from the research into the world. And um, where she lives is, is a very deeply troubled part of the world. And um, she is... Um, very committed to bringing contemplative approaches to peacemaking uh, and to uh, interactions between um, Palestinian and Israeli children, adults, and so forth, and is working uh, in amazing ways to do that. Um, when I was in Israel um, now many years ago, uh, I think it was 2009, um, um, we actually held the first meditation retreat for scientists in Israel, uh, and it was held in this amazing retreat center, which is managed by um, Arabs and Israelis together. Uh, and uh, it was such a beautiful place in which to hold this, and it really um, was uh, the embodiment of uh, the kind of approach that we, that Nava and uh, all of us, uh, I think, are seeking to implement. So, without further ado, Nava. Hey, thank you, Richie. And I have to say that um, for me to come here is my like third time, first time here in the city center. Um, but it's like coming home. Um, Richie is. I just think about Richie, um, my, my heart expands, and, um, and he's really the influence, the big influence on in my career. I remember being a PhD student in the Weizmann Institute in Israel and um, sitting in the physics department doing, trying to do neuroscience uh, with a physicist, and suddenly a PMA paper pops with Richie's work, first works, and I was like, I don't believe these worlds can connect because I was already a Dharma practitioner at that time. And, um, and, and then all the work that has been done in the center is really like, uh, for me, like the, you know, the um, um, vision of where we want to go. So it's really, I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be here, honored to be here and, uh, and, and, and meet all, the, all, all of you. And, Hope that we can discuss later. Um, what I wanted to what I wanted to do today is to give you a glimpse into some part of our work, more the basic science uh, work that's done in our center. Um, and um, when we talk about the yeah, my, this coordination in a moment. Um, so I want to talk about. Um, what do I mean by mindfulness as engagement versus mindfulness belief, and bring some evidence from our lab for mindfulness as engagement, and then how we are trying to advance towards measuring mindfulness as engagement, and then um, also work on mechanisms, um, and specifically I'll talk about um, interception um, as a mechanism of mindfulness engagement, and then I'll talk a little bit about the next step that we're trying to do. And but before I start, I do want to say a few words about um, our um, work, I mean, but the context which I'm coming from. So like she said, the, the center that I'm heading is called the Seagull Center for Brain and Mind. It sits in the Russian University. Until recently, it was called the Interdisciplinary Center. Uh, they became a university two years ago. It's the first private university in Israel, um, which has a pros, pros and cons. But today, the political situation in Israel, um, it's actually pretty good to have a private university, which is not um, doesn't have to give accounts to a government. And that was actually the reason that the head of the university, Uriel Rachman, uh, started all this project, because he had this uh, vision that academics should be uh, um, not related to 
to the government. And in the last year, what we are doing mostly is really focusing on um, understanding uh, the mechanisms that are related to quantitative practices and how, why they are um, promoting well-being and engagement. And we um, also try to bring a lot of diversity work and um, we do cultural adaptation. The two different um, groups in Israel, um, Muslims and Arabs, uh, Bedouins, um, uh, ultra-Orthodox um, uh, people um, from Ethiopian Jews, etc. And also um, working with uh, people that have all kinds of challenges, like people who stutter, um, CP. Uh, so also this is, so um, I'm happy to say that also the center, in terms of students, we have a large diversity. Um, and from and in 2009, really that feeling was um, that there's some urgency in bringing the science to the field. You know, a lot of in Israel really feel the urgency all the time. And um, also the understanding, and it's a lot because of the work being done here, that there's already enough understanding to bring the science into practice and to and to, and to, to the social world. So um, inside the, the Sigal Center, um, we opened the Uda Institute for Mindful Science and Society at the first uh, big conference. Um, Richie was the keynote speaker, and I'll show you a picture of him in the meditation retreat. Uh, so there was a conference, and after that, there was a meditation retreat for scientists. And it was the first time that you know that mindfulness was spoken outside of Buddhist context. Um, and the, it was also the largest conference in, in the Institute. Um, there were so many people that we had to open two big halls and connect them. And it was really a, um, a celebration in 2009. And um, I'm very happy to say that today, 14 years later, mindfulness is, you know, it's like yoga in Israel. Um, you, you, there's many, many people that, are, that, that, that uh, teach mindfulness. We are the only center in Israel that trains mm -hmm. MBSR and MBCT instructors. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of, uh, but we're not a nonprofit, I mean, uh, it's inside the institute, and our main goal is to try to get um, as much as diversity in the mindfulness teachers. And uh, slowly it's also happening. We already have a few MBSR and MBCT teachers from the Arab community, from the um, ultra Orthodox, from the Ethiopian mm -hmm. community. And um, from there, after, uh, uh, we, after a few years, we also um, understood that if you want to make change in society, it's not enough long to cultivate the, uh, uh, you know, people that can bring mindfulness, but also uh, through education. And today we have um, a program that's called the uh, uh, Sagol. Sagol in Hebrew is uh, purple, and it's also the name of our donor. So we call it in Hebrew the Purple School Program, um, and it's um, a mindfulness-based uh, mindfulness-based systems thinking and system setting model for social emotional learning. Um, so uh, and and yeah, so this is the thing that we're doing, and um, it's a lot. You know, being I, it, being a scientist and a social entrepreneur, it's not always easy, um, and there's not a lot of places that actually. Really um, appreciate it, but Richie really appreciate it. That's why. I, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, this I can start working. So let's continue. Ah, uh, no, something stuck here. Uh, yeah, got unstuck. So just to give you an impression, and you can see Richie sitting here in the mindfulness in the retreat for scientists that uh, we gave in the Be Shalom. It's a yeah, it's a um, uh, it's a small um, village that was built by Jews and, and uh, Palestinians, um, and we almost brought His Holiness to Israel, um, 2016, <laughs> and etc. So there's a lot of work. Uh, both um, you know, training people, um, a lot of dissemination of the science through lectures and podcasts and other and, and conferences and meetings between contemporaries and scientists, et cetera. Okay, so let's start with what do we mean by mindfulness and engagement? And of course, there's this uh, uh, famous uh, you know, quote uh, that's always, always used in uh, papers, um, the, the definition, the first definition by John, I think he would 
he would already he he, he would um, uh, uh, define mindfulness much much differently today. But the definition of mindfulness is awareness that arises from paying attention and purpose in the present moment, non judgmentally. <clears throat> and a lot of work that has been done in mindfulness research was really more looking at mindfulness from a point of view of the clinical work of, the, of, of mindfulness as a relief and um, taking. Uh, and yeah, I mean, even a uh, review that comes from here, right? Um, that understanding that, yeah, uh, that, that mindfulness is, is really also good for relief and helps a lot of um, uh, difficulties and clinical issues, but um, it's also um, uh, uh, cultivates core capacities um, that support cognitive and affective systems and, and, and emotional regulation systems and cognitive appraisal. And, then taking from um, borrowing from uh, a paper that I really liked by um, a group that far, but that's the only one that I know from that group, but um, a paper that I found in, in my RT, um, where they distinguish between mindfulness as relief versus mindfulness as engagement. And, um, and really when you go to the more classic views of mindfulness, then you can see that it's really much more than really, right? That mindfulness is a skillful and active process of attention, emotion regulation that guides behavior to reflect one value aligned with an overarching ethical framework. Mindfulness is an active process of engaging attention with challenging experiences um, and to, in order to select among available responses. Um, mindfulness enables the capacity to adaptively engage with situation and with others. Um, and um, inhibit action or take pause before progress, progressing depending on the demands of the situation. So we see that it's much more than the relief is actually not the aim, it's actually on the way to something. That something is to be able to um, actually uh, attend uh, or to, to choose um, and select the response, which is the most beneficial response um, uh, in, in view of the of the, of the situation. And um, so um, I think that, you know, in parallel to the work that's shown that mindfulness can bring relief to, this, to various difficulties, there are also evidence that it actually does enable um, uh, different engagement in the world. And coming just to take, give examples from our work, um, so um, we had this. Uh, work where we took students that came to an MBSR class for their own stress reduction. And there was the protocol was to completely the regular protocol. We didn't say anything about the israeli palestinian conflict. And yet um, we did find that after um, eight weeks compared to a weight list control, um, participants were more supportive of conciliatory policies and um, and and uh, and were open to uh, and felt less intimidated. That was these were Jewish students. They were less uh, intimidated by Palestinians. So something changed in the way that they would that they were open to deal with a very complex situation. And similarly, a paper that is not just was just now submitted to mindfulness uh, journal. Um, we studied we uh, studied how our mindfulness informed protocol. Uh, that helps teachers um, uh, be able to lead controversial uh, discussion of controversial, controversial issues in class. And we found that compared to control, teachers um, um, in, the, in, the, in the intervention group showed significantly higher levels of motivation to engage students in difficult uh, controversial issues. And the students of these teachers had better experience and improved behavior and motivation. So again, we see that it's affecting also behavior in the world. And for example, if we look at um, our work with uh, uh, mindfulness in the service of minorities uh, through the, the cultural education studies. So for example, um, um, this is more qualitative work, but um, when we um, uh, interview people from, that are belong to the Ethiopian Jews community, and similar to here with a lot of differences also, um, they also experience a lot of um, racism and um, social injustice. And you can see from the quotes 
So, um, for example, my reaction to racism is different today. I make efforts, let's say, today I will come across the case of someone racist in the store. Some of them say, go back to Ethiopia. Today I will not be seduced by him. I will not get into the world role that he's creating. Um, usually racism in the sense that I know it is in everyday life and it can suddenly catch you somewhere. It's not something you're preparing for. And the mindfulness tool enables you to have a good basis to pause your automatic response. Um, <clears throat> and, um, um, and, and, and the last sentence here, um, uh, thanks to mindfulness, there's more acceptance, checking in, space to think before responding. So something about um, the, some, something about um, being able to control the situation and not being controlled by it. And if you are interested, then um, I'll also give Cliff um, some advertisement. Uh, I'm going to give a talk about this kind of work in um, California in a few days. And Cliff uh, Saron's um, summit out of the lab and into the world. Okay. So um, how do we go on to try to measure mindfulness as engagement? And before I continue, I actually want to go back to the uh, first suttas, um, um, you know, uh, inspired by, by the Buddhist suttas. And um, when we go to a sutta that is about removing annoyance, so the, the Buddha said, um, so there's, uh, because there are five ways of removing annoyance by which annoyance can be entirely removed. So what, what are the ways? So love and kindness can be maintained in being toward, in being toward a person with whom you are annoyed. Compassion can be maintained in being toward the person. And unlooking equanimity can be maintained. Notice the, the next one, the forgetting and ignoring of a person. So it's like distracting from the situation, yeah, um, can be practiced. Ownership of deeds in a person to whom you are annoyed can be contemplated upon, etc. So you see here five strategies to deal with annoyance. And like Martin, uh, Martin Bachelor said uh, in one of her papers um, that cultivating a diverse regulatory repertoire is an explicit goal of the practice. So there's actually a repertoire of strategies to regulate emotions or to regulate the situation, and they're quite diverse. One of them is even looking away, which is uh, which is completely the other direction from bringing compassion. And it's really interesting that in a field that is not contemplative science, but in the field of resilience and emotional regulation research, actually, this is a very central thing. Um, today, after you know, studying um, how um, um, what, what is the difference between different emotional regulation strategies, actually, this field has uh, reached the conclusion that there's no one good strategy. Um, that actually healthy adaptation is the result of flexibly choosing between the regulation strategies that um, and adapting to, to, to the situational demand. And in this field, uh, regulatory flexibility, which is the ability to move between the strategies in accordance to the, to the demands of the situation, is what is underlying resilience. Um, and when and psychopathology is, is looked upon as the breakdown of regulatory flexibility. So, um, and, and, uh, and you know, when you go into, uh, and, and if you want to say it's more simple, you can say that all the emotional regulation strategies may be maybe mapped on a continuum between engagement with the situation and disengagement with the situation. And the understanding in, the, in that field is that there actually is um, um, advantages and disadvantages to both. It depends on the situation. For example, you know, I was I woke up early this morning, and you know, looking at my my WhatsApp, and <clears throat> in Israel it was around one o'clock, and at two o'clock there is a big demonstration. Now um, I think it's already maybe over. Um, because of the political situation and all my friends and all the WhatsApp groups and everything, you know, and they're sending pictures and everything. And, you know, for me, it was very distracting because I wanted to prepare the talk. I, um, I'm, I'm very upset with what's happening right now in Israel. And at that situation, the most adaptive thing I could do was actually disengage because I, you know, I can't really help from here. Um, you know, it's just making me really angry I can't do anything about it. So the best thing to do is close the WhatsApp for me. <laughs> but so um, so when when there's when the, when emotions are very very high, 
um, and the situation is very, very difficult and complex. Sometimes the most adaptive thing is actually to take, to do some kind of a disengagement in order to reorganize, to be able to come back to a situation later on. Um, and on the other hand, if we all the time do disengagement, then we are not able to solve problems in the world, right? Um, and then engagement, um, is more beneficial when we actually are able and we have the resources to deal with the difficulty because then we can actually change the situation and, 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 and um, affect it. So each uh, so so each continuum has advantages and disadvantages. And how do we know when it's the best, or how do we choose when when it's the best to do this or that? Right. So. Um, um, uh, there's a, a professor in Tel Aviv University, which we, I'm working with, his name is Gal Sheps, who was a student of James Ross, and he developed a paradigm that's called emotion, emotion regulation choice task. It's a very cognitive paradigm, but actually um, there's a lot of research using this paradigm that shows um, that when you present people, we, pre we present people with the, um, uh, pictures with varying emotional, mm -hmm. negative emotional intensity, either high or low and um, before the, starting the task you teach people um, um, cognitive reappraisal or distraction and uh, cognitive reappraisal i think everybody knows cognitive reappraisal right distraction uh, in here is um is it, you, you all all the time you need to look at the picture but thinking about something else so distracting yourself by mental thought by imagining something or thinking about something else like thinking about your street or, or imagining uh, yellow triangle or whatever. Um, and what they found consist consistently uh, to me in the paradigm is that people are shown uh, a picture for a very brief time, and then they need to choose what they want to do, reappraisal or distraction. And then they um, are presented with the image for a longer time, and they need to uh, apply the, the strategy. And after that, they're asked um, what is your um, emotional intensity to, to see that they're actually not to monitor it somehow. And, um, and there's a, quite a lot of work already that shows that um, in low intensity, people tend to choose uh, to be afraid, and in high intensity, that people choose to distract. And, um, and also that um, um, you see that quite a lot of work is also, uh, and it also resonates with work from George Bonanno and people that do more of a resilience kind of study. Um, but um, they show that uh, uh, this actually is a precursor for well-being. So people that can that choose that can um, have the flexibility to either choose distraction or reappraisal based on the intensity of the picture um, and have more. Um, uh, measures higher measures of, of um, well-being and mental health, um, and um, there's also all kinds of theoretical work trying to understand what could be the mechanisms that underlie this ability to mm -hmm. um, uh, to have regulatory flexibility, um, and and we can see a few of the suggestions. So one is um, sensitivity to internal feedback, which we can also say call interception. So the ability to actually um, be sensitive to what your body is saying about the situation. Of course, executive control and ability to move attention. So um, um, yeah, uh, maybe the situation is not pleasant, but I have executive control to decide that I do want to, I, I, that I feel that I do want to um, uh, approach it because this is the right thing to do. Um, and um, and even if I want to be able to distract, I need to be able to move my attention away. This is also uh, a regulation of attention. Sensit sensitivity to context, okay? So for example, if I hear, um, I don't know, if I hear an ambulance outside here in Madison, right? Um, um, then um, knowing the context that I'm in the university, I'm in Madison, this is not an area that is now um, under some difficulty or problem is probably, you know, uh, a, a different situation than if it was a, I don't know, a, in the border between a Israel and, and uh, Gaza, right? So uh, the context and also the people around, you know, how they, how they um, uh, react. And of course, you need a, a wide repertoire of strategies. So if you're not able to move your attention or distract or be able to engage or then, then um, you won't have the flexibility. 
So uh, these are all kinds of precursors uh, from the literature, uh, and most of them are actually theoretical. Most of the work is, um, uh, there's, not, there's, there's some work on, on, on these arrows. And, um, and looking at, at that, uh, we actually um, had developed this working model that says, okay, um, if we look at the, at the classical views of mindfulness as engagement, and we look at this literature, actually, you know, there is quite a lot of literature that, that can suggest that mindfulness affects our sensitivity to internal context, uh, to internal context, to external context, executive control, and uh, uh, increase our repertoire of emotional regulation strategies. I like to see, for example, MBSR as you know, um, a way to actually um, train people to engage and disengage. When you do body scan, right? What do we do? We we engage, and we then we disengage, and then engage in a different part and disengage. And we train this movement of engagement and disengagement. Or when we bring attention to the breath and engage with the breath and disengage from other stimuli, or when we open the attention like uh, in a sitting like a mountain practice and we open and engage with everything, right? So it's a, it's actually a, um, a training of, of a repertoire of strategies. Um, so as a first step, um, I had a great student who today work, works with me in the education program, Lola Kobe, and part of his master's, as a first step was to just try it out and say, is mindfulness practice like we do in MBSR, uh, does it affect regulatory flexibility? So we, we took um, the task by Galshek, and um, we had uh, 111 participants that were um, either, either away from an MBSR or away just control. And in this in this uh, study, uh, they get they got questionnaires at the beginning and the regulatory choice task, um, uh, the questionnaires and the regulatory choice task only at the end. Um, and and there was two studies. Uh, they either they, I mean they had uh, they did the, the task once with uh, the IAX pictures, uh, the normalized international effective picture system, and also with pictures that came actually from the more social political uh, context of Israel, um, high and low intensity. And this was a cross classified multiple, uh, a multi level approach. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see that uh, in both cases, um, uh, you're okay. Okay, yeah. No, I'm looking for the okay pointer. Okay, so in both cases, um, uh, the MBSR is this uh, is this uh, dotted line, and uh, this is the control. And you can see that in both cases, um, the um, MBSR group um, had a different pattern of choice, and actually, um, it was. That the, the, the effect was mostly because they tended to choose less distraction in the low rating, meaning they chose to do more uh, approach, more reappraisal uh, in the in the low rating. This was, I think, this was what, what was driving the effect here mostly. So this was the first uh, demonstration that indeed um, mindfulness practice is affecting uh, the um, uh, pattern of choice of how to deal with um, emotional uh, pictures. Um, and, um, and, and now I want to go to a continuation of this project, but now with an emphasis and also uh, looking at, um, at the first uh, path, which is um, the interception and the internal feedback. So now um, I'm, I want to, des to describe to you two studies. Um, the first study was done with Riva Aldik, and um, this was this was uh, a study that actually looked at the whole pathway <clears throat> of how mindfulness affects regulatory flexibility, uh, regulatory choices, and mental um, uh, uh, health through uh, the sensitivity to internal feedback. And then um, I wanted to describe uh, the project by you all, which is just 
just um, was just uh, submitted, um, which looked at, um, at only at this uh, connection, but I think it can um, enable us maybe to understand better the first result. So let's begin with the first one. So before that, I want to say a few things about intersection uh, to in case you, you're not, you, you, you don't know the, the term so much. So intersection is the perception of neural processing of internally bodily sensations. And um, uh, we know that people that are high in perception, and there's all kinds of methods to look to study trade perception. There's also um, uh, criticism about some of these, but there's standard ways to, to look at trade perception. And people uh, tend to report higher levels of emotional experience um, um, and um, have, are more officially expressive. They have larger um, LPPs, long term, uh, long term uh, potential, potentiation potentials in the brain, which are related to emotional arousal. They report a more intense emotional experience, show greater physiological reactivity, um, and associated, yeah, associated heart rate. Uh, changes to uh, arousal. Um, and in terms of interception and emotional regulation, then training perception is linked, linked with emotional regulation of daily life, better use of the appraisal, uh, decision making. And there is one study that we know of, uh, Bonano, from Bonano's group um, by Jeff Burke, that looked at ongoing interception. And here they ask people, um, to uh, regulate their emotion, to, to always use uh, um, cognitive reappraisal, but they could choose at some point to switch to distraction. So it's called uh, emotional regulation monitoring, but it's also some kind of, of, a, of a choice between uh, between what, can, do I stay with what I'm doing right now or I'm changing? And they found that um, uh, through, the, through monitoring, uh, um, uh, cardiac signals, they found that uh, individuals whose choice to switch from cognitive reappraisal to distraction were, uh, was consistent with um, bodily responses, um, so higher arousal uh, stimuli as indicated by ECG. They also, these, these participants also reported greater life satisfaction. And, and that was, this was also an inspiration to our work. So, um, so yeah, so we wanted to understand how ongoing perception, not trace perception, how ongoing perception uh, signals affect your strategy and can they, can they be affected by mindfulness training? And since mindfulness training is a mind-body practice and there is uh, indications that it uh, affects interceptive abilities, right? Then uh, we should expect that uh, if, uh, um, uh, interception signals are related to uh, the way people select the, the most appropriate uh, their strategy, then uh, mind-body practices such as mindfulness should, should affect that. So we um, have already indications, uh, for example, we, we have, um, yeah, we have, uh, um, we have uh, uh, indications that um, like that the EMG, the facial muscles, um, the, they are predictors of, of, uh, of, of the choices of the, that the people would make. Um, and the ECG actually, we didn't find for non-trained people, but the heart rate responses we did, and I'm going to show you in a moment, but I want to talk first of all about what happens after mindfulness training. So uh, this is this project, and here um, um, we had 80 people randomized into four MBSR workshops. So two were um, intervention and two were the way to control. And this time we gave the um, emotional regulation choice task in the beginning and in the end. And people were also connected to physiological, uh, physiological um, channels. Um, and specifically um, ECG. We were actually we also had EMG, but unfortunately that is, we had a problem with that channel, so we don't we don't have a pre-post. So I'm just going to report about the ECG study, the ECG findings. So first of all, in terms of behavioral level, um, you could see um, 
So the waitlist is the um, full bar, and the strip ones is uh, excuse me, the um, yeah. Uh, this is the this is the um, waitlist, and this is the NBSR, and the first the pre is the full bar, and then strip is the second the the post. And you can say that for the waitlist, there's no uh, change in the rate of choosing distraction for low intensity and for high intensity. Um, and also in the beginning, there's no difference between the two groups. But in the MBSR group, that we see um, that um, the, there's a difference in the, they tend to choose less distraction, even in the high intensity. And um, they also choose less distraction compared to the uh, to the weightless control. So this is the behavioral uh, behavioral results, and it's nice, but it's I mean, it, 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 it's expected uh, based on our previous results, and we also find the changes in uh, mindfulness levels and, and uh, well-being. But what I wanted to show you in this slide. So this is the the way to really look at the, at the results is through a cross-classified model, but it's more, uh, I, I feel that it's more less intuitive to understand the results. So we look at this graph, um, but this is the graph that was actually shown in the paper, um, because when you do the cross-classified model, you can actually look at, you can actually talk about prediction, because you look at every trial, uh, every trial, every person. But if we look at, um, we want to get the gist of it, then um, what you see here is each bar is the heart rate deceleration rate. Okay, how much the heart rate accelerated, um, and it's not it's not divided into low uh, intensity images and high intensity image, which is a normalized a, a rate, right? But uh, we look at actually. <coughs> how much the heart rate accelerated for the pictures for which the participants chose to be appraised versus chose to distract before and after, T1 and T2. And you see for the weightless control, nothing interesting is really happening here. For the MBSR, okay, so in the beginning, again, no difference between uh, the pictures where they chose to be appraised or to distract. But after the training, we see that in pictures that the participant chose to distract, there's a much greater uh, heart rate acceleration than in, in pictures that they chose to be appraised. Um, and also that, 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 uh, that the acceleration rate is, is also lower. Okay, so on one hand, we saw from the behavioral results that they tend to be appraised more in general. But within their choices of distracting and reappraisal, what is driving it or predicting it in some level is um, their heart rate acceleration. So the body is starting to be uh, has a has a has a, a role here in their choices. And um, and uh, um, I think this is I think this is a, a nice study because it's. I don't know, it's my study, yeah, but I like the results. <laughs> I like the, the results, it's first results, it's first results, you know, this is the beginning of a way. But I think it's it's starting to tell us something about how, uh, you know, when we're, we walk around the world and uh, things happen and we have all this information that we need to decide what we do with the things that are happening and how, when we start tuning the uh, connection between the body and the brain, um, this is a channel that can be available for us to be able to make decisions, to make a regulatory decision. And, um, and, and now I want to connect it to a, to a study that was done without a mindfulness practice, uh, just looking at the same paradigm, but this time uh, looking at the heart brain responses. So if you want to look at interception, Maybe the most direct way is actually to look at the heart rate responses. And um, if, if some of you work with EEG, then when you have a lot of heart rate responses and you add to them, it's called the heart rate evoked potential. Okay. Um, and what you do in, is actually the heart has its, you know, the heart has the beats, the heart beats. 
And uh, in the meantime, there's all this um, um, activity in the brain. And the heart brain responses are the responses, the EEG responses that are locked to the heartbeat. Okay. Um, and uh, people found that uh, uh, these cortical potentials that are time locked to the heartbeat are can be located to the receptive regions, um, and the amplitude increases when we attend to the to the heart. And the the amplitudes of the heart rate responses are related to emotional arousal, to emotional valence, and to affective uh, judgment. And what we did in this uh, study was a study that was based on and I had two studies, two small studies. In the first one, um, <coughs> we, we, we did the same paradigm that I told you about. Um, and in this paradigm, the um, image exposure was one second, which is what's usually used when people do behavioral studies with this paradigm. And in one second, usually you have one heartbeat, okay? Um, so we, we take this heartbeat um, for every trial and we look at uh, what the people chose in the end to uh, what, what was their choice, and we see uh, this what is the heartbeat uh, uh, reactivity that it predicts. And the second study, the men in the second study, we um, uh, prolonged this picture exposure to four seconds. Um, and here you have around four heartbeats that go, go in, and we wanted to see is there a difference between the first heartbeat, the second heartbeat, the third heartbeat. Um, and <clears throat> what we found, first of all, for the first study, was there's one heartbeat. So if you're really interested in the methodology, I just you know write it down here. But I want to give the bottom line. The bottom line was that the heartbeat, uh, the HBR's amplitude, um, as it increases the odds of selecting distraction increases, and this is above and beyond the normative rating score. Um, so yeah, we use the uh, logistic regression, and, and uh, that was the, the, the first study. The second study, we looked at the four heartbeats. The third and the fourth heartbeat were not predictive of anything, so we focused on the first and the second. For the first uh, uh, heartbeat, we replicated the, the, the results of the study of the first study. What was interesting was the second heartbeat. The second heartbeat had a predictive power on the choice, but in the opposite direction. So the amplitude of the second heartbeat predicted subsequent strategy selection above and beyond the amplitude of the first and the normative rating. And but as the amplitude increased, the odd of selecting distraction decreased. So now it's actually predictive of more reappraisal. And I think it's, uh, I find this uh, um, result interesting. Uh, and also, and also that there was a change in the topography. So while the first heartbeat, you can see that the topography is more central, for the second heartbeat, you see that it's more frontal. And I think it's, it, I mean, one explanation, which of course is, is only speculation at this moment, is that uh, connecting to the MBSR, the MBSR study is that uh, when you have the, when, when the second heart, when, when the information is available to you, so the first reaction, right, the first encounter with the situation, Right, that would be the most like the more makes maybe auto, uh, uh, automatic reaction, and that that would be predictive of distraction. The more the emotional, um, the stimuli is more emotional, negative emotion, then you would want to distract, you want to disengage. But if you have time, and maybe if you have access also to the next moment, then you actually also have the possibility maybe. To, uh, to 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 choose differently, and it is to take to, to approach. Okay, and it's interesting because that's what we found, right? We found that in general, people after MBSR they tend more to approach, um, and um, and I think this can maybe you know I'll be happy to hear ideas for future for future directions from from you also. But I think that could also maybe help us understand. Why we want to do this training? We want to have this channel um, of the body signals much more available 
uh, so that in, in, in situations, it won't, won't be only the first reaction, right? The automatic reaction, but also the next information that's coming in is available also to actually um, be able to engage with the situation and be able to deal with it and, and affect the situation. Okay, so um, next step in a few moments, a few minutes, and then um, question. Um, okay, so uh, you know we can ask, yeah, what about the ethical side, right? Uh, it's not only about choosing uh, what's good for me to engage or disengage, but also maybe from an ethical point of view to engage is what, what I need to do right now. So um, I have a student now trying to think about how we can expand this into an, into an ethical framework. And if you have ideas, I'll be happy to hear. Um, and also um, um, beyond the FDSR, right? Um, other hard practices and even the attitudes that we come with, um, that could can they affect these, uh, these pathways. I forgot to say, I oh, remember I forgot to say in the MBSR study that it wasn't only that um, the heart rate acceleration predicted uh, people's choices. People who had that the, that the heart rate differentiated more between reappraisal and distraction um, also reported a higher um, well being after MBSR. So this is the, the pathway that um, to, 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 the, to understanding the effect on mental health and well being. Um, Okay, I wanted to say something about the mindfulness map that we developed from practical. And so there's a lot of models, amazing models, and models that I give my students to teach. Uh, you know, this this center has has produced several of these models. Um, but um, from a practical classification, from a practical point of view, um, um, can we um, describe more what the mindfulness practices are doing? But um, I, I think I, I'll skip that because uh, I want to say something um, about our future neuroscience work, and that is looking at uh, tension flexibility. So it's not enough that I want to distract or want to engage, I need to be able to move my attention in a flexible way. And, um, and, and I want to be able to dis uh, engage when I need to engage and disengage when I Need to disengage, and how do we how do we actually study that um, beyond you know there's a lot of um, of, of the uh, behavioral uh, 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 ways to study uh, attention based on reaction time and stuff like that, um, but it doesn't really catch engagement and disengagement directly. And here we collaborate with Andreas Kai from Florida, and who's an expert on um, steady state evoked potential. Steady state evoked potential, but really interesting uh, potential because what you do is you can evoke steady state evoked potentials by stimuli that are flickering in a constant rate. It could be, for example, dots flickering, visual dots. It could be um, 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 uh, auditory waves that are flickering. It could be um, uh, some other sens sensory flickering on the, on the skin, for example. And what happens on the cortical level is that you get uh, um, EG signals that have the same frequency as the, as the flickering frequency of the stimuli. And the amplitude of these uh, waves are affected by attention. So for example, if I have red and blue flickering dots and I ask you to attend to the blue, and you now have more attention in the blue, I would, and the blue is flickering in 16.7 hertz, I would see a rise in the, um, in the amplitude of the 16.7 uh, frequency in your brain. And if I ask you to attend the red flickering dots, which are flickering at almost 12, I will see a rise in the 12. So this is a way to see where people are attending without them moving their eyes and without reaction time, anything you just, uh, people are, you can see where, where, where the attention is. And uh, as a first step, uh, so for example, a stimuli, for example, uh, here you have four um, clouds of dots, green, left, green, right, red, uh, left, red, right. And each of can be flickering in different frequencies. So we have four frequencies. And if, for example, I asked you to attend to the red 
on the right, which is let's say flickering at 12 hertz, I will see um, a rise in that 12 hertz amplitude. And if I ask you to attend to the green, and you're not moving your eyes, you're looking at the at the middle there at the white point, and you're just um, attending to 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 uh, uh, either right or left, I will see where you're attending. So I can actually monitor where you are. And as a first step, the old charisma um, um, and, uh, and, and the other people in the lab, they uh, demonstrated that we can actually, uh, we can ask, ask people to look at this flickering dot and either try to uh, measure, to, to count how many times they see some kind of coherent motion or count their heartbeat. So they see the same thing all the time, but they either attend outside or attend inside, and we can uh, differentiate between uh, when they're attending inside and when they're attending outside. Okay, so when their attention is is, uh, is external or internal, we demonstrated it on two uh, frequencies, 10 hertz and 15 hertz. Um, and now we are trying to try to measure engagement and disengagement. So going back to the example I gave you before, we could ask you, uh, each trial would be um, to attend to one side in a, in a specific color. And then at some point we'll switch and tell you to attend to another side or the same side in a different color. So there's a, there's a switching in, in, in each trial. And all the time you were looking in the middle and what we uh, are able to show is, okay, so the blue is when you're attending to the first stimuli and the red is when you're attending to the second stimuli. So if you're really good, right? Um, when we ask you to attend to the first stimuli, the blue should go up and the red should be down. You're supposed to be attending only to the stimuli that we're telling you and, and not attending to all the other. And then when you do this, and then the switching happens here in the pink line. And now the, the second stimuli, the red should go up and the blue should go down. So actually what you're doing is, is you're engaging, right? And then at some point you're disengaging from the blue and re-engaging to the red. So there's engagement and disengagement here. And, um, and, and you can actually quantify when you uh, attend to, to the first, attend to the second, don't attend to the first and don't attend to the second. So how much you're engaging and disengaging. Um, and very, very, very first um, uh, result, um, still ongoing work, but it seems that when, that, uh, when people have this pattern, which is engage in what you need to engage and disengage from what you don't need to engage, it correlates with uh, positively with the mindfulness. We use the mass here because it's more attentional, um, a more attentional mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It negatively correlates with the state anxiety and with the emotional relation suppression. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the type of work we're trying to do. We're try still trying to figure out what to do with it in terms of contemplative practice and what we can do. There is a possibility to um, couple it with emotion. Like for example, through uh, some kind of threat that's that's coupled with the with the with the dots. We we have um, now also moved to auditory, and we want to move to somatosensory. Okay, so this is like the more basic stuff that we're doing. The yeah, finished. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so a lot of uh, great people, and um, and you know this is um, like all kinds of um, ideas that we're trying to. Um, to develop, but a lot of questions. And if you guys have ideas how to go forward with it or uh, questions, um, I'll be happy to hear now or later. Okay, that was wonderful. Uh, it's 10.56, we have uh, just a few more minutes. Uh, I need to go to a meeting at 11, um, but others can hang out for a while. Uh, so let's open it up for questions. Yeah. Uh, one idea is, uh, so if they're seated, the, uh, there's a possibility to lower the heart rate by three to four beats by activating the leg muscles. And have you put an EMG on the leg muscles to see if maybe what we're measuring is the urge to fly into action? Okay. So you're saying if they're seated, 
If they're seated and they contract their lower extremity any muscles, you can probably lower the heart rate by about three to four beats per minute. Okay. And that could be related to compassion, that they have the urge to act. Have you put an EMG on the lower extremities? No. I think that might be a really interesting compliment to the diagnosticus and the uh, coordinator is to see if it maybe just related to their feeling compassion, they want to act. And if the physical activation of muscles could be enough to have that much response in the heart rate. Okay, sounds great. I'd be happy to hear more. Yeah, yeah, I'm an exercise physiologist, so that's a perfect Yeah, I think I, I took a few yoga classes with you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? And then I'm also in 2016. To talk further about heart contractility, because I think part of what we're measuring there is contractility, and to take a look at what mediates contractility from the lens of exercise discs. Yeah, Thank you. Love yeah. it. Love it. <laughs> Questions or ideas? Norma, I wanted to just ask you a specific question about interception. Are there any data that show that the heartbeat evoked response is predictive of a behavioral measure of interceptive accuracy for heart rate? That the heartbeat evoked response is predictor of interceptive accuracy. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, it, it, you're using the heart rate of both response in some way to reflect interception. Yeah. So but it, do we know that it really does? Okay, so, so the field of interception, as you probably know, okay. is a, a very um, a vibrant field, but also mm -hmm. has a lot of difficulties. And that is that um, there's various measures, and it seems like they 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 measure a little bit different uh, dimension. And from what we we know, um, the heartbeat, the, the the actually the heartbeat uh, related potentials are uh, the ones that are considered most directly studying interception. All the other things like heartbeat counting. You know how much it doesn't. It doesn't uh, 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 necessarily reflect your uh, conscious awareness, or you know how much you're accurate. Um, and the studies don't necessarily show that. I mean, the the the, the correlation between how accurate you are on heartbeat counting tasks um, is not. Uh, the correlation is not very very strong to heartbeat uh, potential. But there are studies that show that when people attend to their heartbeat, then the heartbeat um, potentials grow. So they are affected. And at least from what we know in the literature, uh, the, 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 the most direct way to study interception is looking at the heartbeat potentials. Uh, because this is, you know, this is the potentials that are activated by the heartbeat. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that this is that people are aware. For example, in our study, the mm -hmm. NPSR, I didn't say that they were aware of their deceleration. I don't, I'm not sure they were aware, but yeah. it, but the, the information was accessible to them. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, conceptual question. Yeah. Are you conceptualizing new appraisals of one of the So, th that, no, the field of emotional regulation is, is the concept. Is conceptual Excuse right. me, I'm going to yeah. respond to this meeting. Yeah. Can someone um, just Take, okay, good. <laughs> um, so reappraisal, you know, there's also uh, the work by um, Gar by Garland and Farb and Ferguson, right? So they look at reappraisal as actually uh, a central uh, aspect of what's happening in mindfulness. Um, you, you're asking about reappraisal or cognitive reappraisal specifically? Cognitive reappraisal. Cognitive reappraisal. Okay, so from a point of view of a practitioner, <laughs> I have some thoughts about this cognitive reappraisal, right? Because when you actually um, try to uh, reappraise a situation differently, you may say that maybe you're actually disengaging in order to get into this mental structure that mm -hmm. helps you, right? Um, but in the literature of emotional regulation, and here um, we just went with the you know with the field, cognitive reappraisal is a form, it's considered on the, on the continuum a way to, uh, to, uh, to to engage because you have to you have to um, you still are with the situation, even if you're trying to give it a different interpretation, you're still with the situation 
as opposed to looking away or thinking about something else, distracting yourself with you know what you ate in the morning, right? Which would be much more distraction. Sure, yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that we're proceeding in valid. I think I'm just referencing some of the research by Brett for which shows that those more likely to engage in cognitive reappraisal are less likely to use political action. Mm -hmm. So, and that way, I guess, it could be conceptualized as a form of disengagement mm -hmm. because you're, I guess, taking direct engagement for your own emotions, but you're not. Changing mm -hmm. the environmental causes. Mm -hmm. of your I, I agree with you. That's why I think the ethical right sure, issue, yeah. because this said that this said paradigm is 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 you know the context in which you are asking yourself, will I choose this or that? Is only yourself, right? It's mm -hmm. not a more larger context of saying. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, uh, if I know that actually engagement is a way to also affect things that they will maybe change, um, yeah, I agree with you. I I I, I have a lot of uh, discussions with Gal Shex, which is like right. a, a much regulation researcher, and I and I you know say accept we think that accepting strategies right and compassion strategies are much more engagement. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the field of emotional regression, these are just now beginning to be introduced into the study. That's a really funny a lot of sense with that paradigm mm -hmm. um, of because the context is just the self. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And that's also the limitation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you guys, I think you need to go, so don't be too polite. <laughs> I'm here if anyone wants to ask questions, and um, really thank you again for the attention. I was asking about yesterday. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was asking what I was.